So Great. welcome everyone. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz and I'm the founder and director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Um, this is uh, the last of um, a series uh, that we put together with the help of, of Sky Carter, who I'm thrilled to have here, who's going to uh, take the reins and be in control of the evening tonight. So um, we've had a, a wonderful series of talks, which we'll put a link to um, all of the ones which were taped in the chat. And you can go back and, and look at some of them as if, if you like. Um, and uh, it's, been a, it's been an attempt to, over the course of the year, coming out of last summer, to think really about you know the question not what are we fighting against that's how we originally formulated it, but what are we fighting for what's the what's the what's the goal what are, what's the end game and um you know do we need a revolution or not that's how uh, we framed the question at the beginning we've had some really wonderful talks um and sky has really done an amazing job helping to to curate and, and run this lecture series. So it's been a pleasure working uh, with you, Sky, and I'll let you uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Roger. Um, and thanks to Jenna Wortham and Linda Villarosa for being here tonight. So for those of you who don't know, um, Jenna Wortham is a cultural critic, half of the Still Processing Pod, award-winning Still Processing Podcast. Um, and we also have Linda Villarosa here, who is on top of being Nick Villarosa's mom, which is an incredible honor. <laughs> um, she's also an award-winning author herself, and both are contributors to the 1619 Project, um, which is an incredible series of um, essays and investigations that you can find on the New York Times, you can find at the New York Times. Um, and I, so I invited them both to come speak to me today about Black Futurity, as has been the general theme of the lecture series thus far. And having them end it, first of all, both being contributors to the Black Futures book, um, usually what I would ask my interlocutors is basically about what, what is the ideal future? What are you fighting for? Um, and both of you have clearly, you have a whole book about it. So <laughs> made that very easy for me. Um, but I kind of wanted to start with legacy and legacy within the concept of Black futurity. And um, Linda, within Black Futures, Linda had written an essay about family and specifically the ways that her experience having her children was brought up as somewhat grading to, as, as grading to um, modern queer radical movements that like her children or her having children would be against her activism, was not the future that the people around her wanted for her. Um, and I wanted to ask, one, how do you see, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask, first of all, how would you have rather be treated in that moment? And I also wanted to ask, how do you think you would have been responded to today? Well. First of all, thank you, Sky, for the invitation. It's always wonderful to be with my friend and colleague, Jenna Wortham, who the brilliant and wonderful and creative. Um, I'm very happy to be at Bard, where um, my son Nick goes, and my daughter Callie is also here. Um, and to talk about this book, Black Futures, I have so many copies that <laughs> I could just keep pulling them out because I'm so <laughs> proud to be Aww. part of it. And um, I, when Jenna asked me to do an essay for Black Futures, I thought, oh, you know, cause I thought, oh, I didn't kind of, I mean, I see myself as part of the movement, but I was excited and happy to be invited. And um, so my piece looks at when I, um, my mother was really into family. She was not so into me being queer at the beginning, but she came around but she didn't kind of connect being queer and having children together. It seemed like an oxymoron to her. So, but she was, you know, very, um, family is very important to her, thus important to me. So I got pregnant um, using an alternative <laughs> method of insemination. And then uh, when pregnant, I was surprised that my friends were really not, some of them were really not very supportive because they too didn't see being queer um, 
it was more like, oh, we should be activists. That is where our energy should go. We shouldn't be trying to have children because it looked like we were trying to mimic heterosexuality. And so being queer was this radical thing that you were and it was revolutionary. And so having children was not part of the mix. And um, right now, I don't feel that. I have a lot of, you know, my queer friends have children. Um, I, my, I have children. Um, my children have gone to, gone on to be part of queer activism, which I'm really proud of them. And so it actually, what those friends that were saying that I was doing something wrong um, were actually the ones who were wrong. And um, what's really nice is it's come full circle for me because my children are very close to their kind of a crazy and always radical grandmother who was the one who started all of this in the first place. So that's kind of where I am with this. And Jenna, for you, I know you don't have children, or not that I know of, <laughs> but I know the process of leg legacy for you might look a little bit different in terms of not having biological children or what even you would want your legacy to look like as a queer black person. Yeah. Also, just to echo Linda, Sky, thank you for inviting us here. It was a lot of logistical back and forth, but it's so lovely to share space in this way. And I always love a chance to talk to Linda. And um, it's just such a nice feeling. So thank you for having us. And thank you to everybody who's tuning in tonight. And there are a million other things one could be doing on a Thursday and you're here with us. So deeply appreciated. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any... Um, children of my own, but I did help raise in a very um, black family way. I did help raise my niece and I do feel like she's of me, even though she's not born of me. I, you know, I call her my guide child and we just have such a different relationship because she um, came into being when I was 16. And so she's been with me for so long and our relationship is really intimate and uh, I do feel like I've shaped a being and I do have a lot of, um, and maybe this is kind of what you're getting at as well, Sky. I do feel like I have a lot of queer babies that I keep tabs on and I keep eyes on and, um, you know, just check in on and just try to, you know, just make sure they feel cared for and held, especially in New York City, which is such a rough place to live. And, you know, pre-pandemic, I was really invested in constantly having people over and having meals and just kind of making sure that there was sort of this element of care in the mix and in the flow that wasn't about, um, yeah, it wasn't tied to networking or it, the only value was to feel loved and to feel loved. And so that is something that I think a lot about um, because that was offered to me when I came to New York and it's been something that I think a lot about um, you know, being part of that reciprocity, even if it's not with the people that invited me in, but just passing it forward in a way. Um, and I do think a lot about becoming a parent. And so I'm always asking my friends who are parents. And I think even Linda, when I came over to your house, I was like, how do you do it? How do you have a life as a journalist and a creative and a critical thinker? And, and then also have children who need so much from you because I haven't yet resolved that algorithmic math in my mind yet. Um, and I'm told there's no answer. You just kind of have to do it. But I think um, in terms of the book, I mean, it was really wonderful when Linda said that that's what she wanted to write about, because I think, you know, it's so interesting to think about legacy beyond um, the material things we leave behind. It's really interesting to think about the networks and webs and ethics of ideas and ideals that we pass along. And so it's, it's one of my favorite pieces because of that. And it's something that there's so many intangible ways to leave a legacy, you know, and even when we have a really concrete legacy, people don't even pay attention anyway. Like I just watched the Polly Murray documentary that's premiered at Sundance and all these people, mostly white, were like, I don't know who that is. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, Polly left behind a large body of work. And so sometimes we don't even have agency over if we create what would consider you know, be considered a tangible le legacy. It's not even seen that way. So, yeah. Mm. And that's what's kind of interesting about Black Futures though, is that it is, like you actually aren't necessarily reaching into the future. You're collecting the, you're collecting all the legacies of the present mm. in a way. Cause like, I know a lot of the pieces that I, 
that I that I've vaguely seen because I have not read Black Futures yet. I'm trying to get my hands on a copy as soon as <laughs> possible. <laughs> but are all of artists that I, many artists that I haven't known, a lot of artists that aren't necessarily like big in the mainstream, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so it kind of leads me to ask you both, do you feel like you're living in the Black future currently? Or in the ways that, yeah, I'll stop. I'm not trying to create crazy questions. Do you feel like- You're doing great. You're doing great. Thanks, Jenna. <laughs> but do you feel like you're living in a Black future or in your version of what you want that to be? Oh my God, I don't know. It's so, <laughs> it's so hard to think about that. You know, right now is so complicated. And, you know, we're living in certainly a time. Um, we're trying to make a future, make a way. Um, I think that this, this moment that we've gone through is changing us in ways that are, you know, we're gonna soon see how, you know, what happens. And, you know, it's been hard to navigate. It's very hard. I teach college and I see what a lifeline my class is to my students in ways that I didn't understand before. And it makes me sad that, you know, I know at Bard, you're a little bit more in person than I am at City College, but I'm, you know, I think a lot about um, my students as, you know, future. And the, this, this moment is painful and hard for them. And, you know, I see, I see the stress and I see, you know, what's going on with them. And I used to be like, turn on your camera, I wanna see you. And now I'm like, you know what, you just please, as long as you're there, um, I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad that we're, you know, we're in community together because I know it's, you know, this is a very hard time. Mm. I would, I would be interested in hearing Sky's answer to that question as well, because um, I would love to know how you perceive this moment. I think there are some things for me that feel really future. You know, if I just even look at the course of my life, 30 some years, you know, there, there are things that are incredible to see, you know, and this is kind of Linda speaking to as well. It's, I, I do feel this incredible pull forward and this incredible pull backwards, which is maybe what it means to live in the present. But I was even thinking about the press tour for Black Futures with few exceptions. And I mean, few as in like less than five, maybe one or two people. Um, everyone that we talked to who wanted to interview us and write about the book was Black. And that's amazing. And I didn't expect that. I don't, I mean, being in media, especially like that tells me a story about who's writing, who's able to successfully pitch pieces like about this book. I mean, even in my own personal history, I can remember feeling, I, I can remember a time where it might be hard to pitch a piece on a book like this, um, hard to get interest, hard to drum it up, but it's just undeniable. And that's not the sum of progress or the sum of, of what it means to be living in a Black futures, but I guess it's interesting just to note that shift for myself. Um, but I think it's hard to, really grapple with the notion of futurity with with everything that's happening that feels like such a fight against it and I think rather the acknowledgement that the future we want is not shared universally is more where I'm sitting in like, like that grief or that understanding or trying to think about what um what would feel satisfying to me, you know? Like, what do I want to see? And it's it's largely not bound up in electoral politics, but that's often where a lot of the energy goes. So it's been a really interesting period of investigating about that. I was thinking um, of this thing and, and I can't remember where I know it because I keep looking it up and not finding it. So I'm, it's an Audre Lord something that I know she said, but now I'm like, did she say it to me personally? Why do I know this? <laughs> so, um, but it was like when something is dying, it doesn't go out pretty it goes out ugly. And so there's a, you know, it, mm. when things shift and they're dying and something's changing, it's not easy. It's like, you know, like in the end of a, in a movie or, you know, in real life, when people are dying, they don't just leave, they go out with a fight. And mm -hmm. so I think this is what we're experiencing right now is this shift in, you know, American culture where it's, you know, going out real ugly. <laughs> I watched the impeachment trial mm. today. I couldn't suck myself away. And I was thinking, my God, this is so horrible <laughs> seeing this over and over um but it's how you know the shift is going out ugly mm, mm. Mm. but
But Sky, <laughs> what's your thought? <laughs> I, I have so many thoughts right now. I'm kind of caught on the thought of if, if we're going out, where are we going? <laughs> um, but I'm also thinking about how, like, is the shift for both of you, I guess, um, the shift that Jenna talks about and also what allowed for Black Futures to be able to be put to print. Um, and on, honestly, probably the same shift that allowed for this lecture series to come to be between the Floyd protests and just the innumerable, the innumerable amount of Black folk that have been killed on the public stage. For you both, do you feel like that shift is, is welcome? To know that, because I know, it, I know it's difficult because I'm simultaneously of being that like blackness is blackness is so in right now, um, for truly like abhorrent reasons, and as well as like the ways of if black futures is now able to like be put to print, what does that mean about how commodifiable blackness is right now, or how? Yeah, I guess what that means. If either of you want to speak on that. Well, I don't know if this is exactly the same, but um, I was on one of these, one of a call like this with Nicole Hannah Jones. Okay. So we're kind of like opposites in the temperament. So my temperament is a little bit sunny. I'm like a little yellow flower, and she's a little bit not like that. And so we were talking about this very question. I was saying, I'm really hopeful about what's going on. This was a, a bit ago. Um, I'm really hopeful about what was going on. She's like, well, I'm not, you're just so Pollyanna. You should. And I just thought, huh. <laughs> and I've been thinking about that because I don't really think as hope, I'm not as hopeful as I was, but I still probably feel more hopeful than others. Um, but I think this is hard and I think it's okay to have like a kind of a whiplash in your thinking. Like one day you're kind of like, oh, things are going to be fine. And then the next day is, no, they're not. We need to be survivalists. And, um, you know, then the next day it's like, oh, no, it's fine. Calm down. <laughs> so it's hard right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there were two parts to your question, Sky, and I'm trying to remember the first part. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about this question of commodification because it's just so inherent. This call started, Sky called me a Marxist, and I guess I, in some ways, have been really leaning on Marxism and rereading it because there's a of what we have in this world without Blackness as a commodity, you know, and I think it's about kind of just recognizing the structures and the infrastructures we live within and, and what to do about it and what feels, you know, we were we were talking um, before we started this call about the institution of tipping and just recognizing that, you know, when we talk about a living wage, it's not just about do people deserve more money or how much money do we deserve? You know, it's it's about recognizing that we're, that's actually a, vesti a vestigial hangover of an institution that was trying to not pay black people as much, you know, specifically black women to sort of keep them from being paid what their counterparts are being paid and requiring them to um, do more emotional labor to get those tips to when I was a waitress, you know, you had to kind of just smile and take, you know, that's like the culture, you know, and, and so when we think about um, organizing around these ideas and organizing around what it means to to care about something like that that is a way of pushing back against that commodification it's not necessarily you know i think our feeds are so full of campaigns and ads and things that i personally don't always feel offended by like i'm i don't know i i kind of love seeing you know come up and and I, I don't know I'm thinking about this HBO art documentary like I can't wait yeah. to watch that and like yeah. <laughs> because HBO made a documentary about artists does that mean they're commodified no it means a lot more people get to enjoy the work of Jordan Castile and that's so important you know it's so important to me who's the artist I say specifically because that's the artist whose work appears next to Linda's essay in Black Futures um but yeah I think it's I think it is about you know being so critically minded, you know, and I think the critique, of Super Bowl, I mean, there are many critiques on the Super Bowl, but I think it was really interesting when people were saying, look how Tom Brady was treated versus Colin Kaepernick. I mean, that is really the type of critique and the, the mental gymnastics we kind of have to do to stay on top of it. Um, 
So those are the things that came up when you asked that question. But there was a first part to it that I missed. But, but when, Sky, do you think we're living in the Black futures? You didn't really tell us. That That is true. Um, all right. The, the first part to the question was also if you, if either you felt like that shift was welcome. Oh, I see. I see. It did have to come on the literal bodies of other people that look like us. Um, but two, do I think we're living in the Black future? I'm not sure. I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm 20 years old. I've only been here a couple decades. <laughs> and I, the more I learn about myself as a Black person, as a queer person, um, as a femme person, the more I see myself as a part of a cycle in the ways in which I feel like I think alone in the past like 10 years in the ways of like like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Philando Castillo like Black people continue to die and we continue to show up for them and the cultural moment that that creates around those deaths happens over and over and over again. Um, the Floyd protest being just like another extension of that. And that also extends back to Rodney King. That also extends back to so many, so many other like bombastic moments in history that have come about because of the death of black people, the violent death of black people on a, on a public stage. And I, I, what seems to change though is maybe the cultural production of those moments in some ways that I do feel that like Trayvon Martin's death created a very different, Trayvon Martin's death, or at least in my head, I'm, I'm from Florida. Um, so I didn't live too far from my gardens when he was killed by George Zimmerman. By George Zimmerman but his death created like a big push of black people within Florida to join electoral politics, including his own mother. With George Floyd's death amongst others within that, I think there's, there's been a lot more push away from electoral politics, away from reformism, away from, away from the status quo, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, hmm. <laughs> I don't, that is, I, yeah, it's a, such a hard question that I asked you both. <laughs> but I, I feel, I feel like I'm at the edge of another cycle, at the end of another elliptical cycle in, in blackness and black futurity, which is why I'm like so interested in the question of where we're trying to go, mm. where the ideal future would be when this quote unquote might end, or if it doesn't end, what are we, mm. what am I really fighting for? I saw something that resonated with me. Um, it was, I don't, maybe on one of my feeds and it was a group of black men um, who were Harvard medical school students and they were wearing hoodies and um, they said they buried us, but they didn't know we were seeds. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> it was so cool because I had to think about it for a minute. It's like, oh, these are, you know, of course we, don't, we shouldn't have to have be, you know, progress on the deaths of other people. But um, I love the idea that, you know, they buried us, but they didn't know we were seeds. And then here's a generation of um, black men um, in medical school. Mm -hmm. um, and so that resonates with me because of my work in public health. And mm. I really liked that. And I felt like, oh, that was a positive thing I saw yesterday. And now I can <laughs> be mm. funny again for a minute. And there's some ways that like black queer death means more now, which I appreciate in any small way. Mm. I think I wouldn't have, 10 years ago, I don't think I would have known about like the black queer femmes that were dying, black trans women that were dying. I. I appreciate being able to being able to even know their names mm. in any small in a very very small way because we know that the registry for 
black trans death and black trans death in general is like only a few years old but that momentum maybe poses a lot of hope for me mm. 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 yeah i like what kimberly just put in the chat hey boo hi kimberly <laughs> The momentum of Black progress is within a long chronology of Black excellence and Black violence against us. And it makes me think a lot about, um, or at least this elliptical feeling that you're talking also about skies. Um, Adrian Reed Brown talks a lot about this in different ways, but there's a, a podcast where, you know, she was just making the point that we are so conscious of all the dystopias around us that it's really hard to remember there are also utopias being built around us as well and that those are hidden and those are not, you know, there is a lot of interesting like research based evidence though about how all of the news and information that we see is does capitulate towards the more negative end of the spectrum it just does better it's like it confirms our negative bias it confirms the experience that we have or the feelings that we have that everything feels terrible and everything is shit and to some degree that's true you know but. I think it's it's really interesting to me to think about, you know, the the stuff that's being built that might be the most exciting is the most invisibilized. And then that makes me feel good because maybe it's protected because there is such a desire and, you know, gravitation towards anything that feels like a positive, positive and openly black. And so to think about, um, you know, that invisibility is maybe a protective mechanism is kind of interesting to me as well. Hmm. I really like that. Um, but also in my own work, I try to lift up the, you know, the person who's, you know, in my head, the hero or heroine who is black, who is making a difference because some of the <clears throat> things I write about are sad and hard and um, they do involve death and illness. And so in my stories, I try to find someone who is the person making the difference. And um, that's the person that I spend the most time with. And then it, you know, who kind of opens the door for me on whatever story, whatever issues I'm reporting about. And so that, and that kind of, otherwise I get too down too. <laughs> and I feel like, oh, I appreciate being around someone who's really, you know, driving forward something positive. My next question wants to be where you both see like what are small examples of like those utopias you speak of? But I almost feel like in saying them that we uncover them and then they're not safe anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you both have come across this now that you're reporting or even in your comp compilation of black futures. Cause I think what's also interesting about like you two, your work is also it's it's widely consumed. And so you both are also in a very particular position to, to exhume certain histories and allow them to be seen by others. Um, but the question is, um, hmm. Hmm. Um, one small thing that I don't feel like is, is revealing anything precious, too sacred. Um, I think that, you know, I, there will never be enough, I don't know, I, the cost is too high, you know, to your point, yeah. Scott, the cost is too high and it will never be enough. There, there will never be enough stuff, enough diversity and inclusion programs, enough whatever to make up for the, the, the losses that are happening and still happening. And um, there's just no amount of justification in my mind. And um, something that I think about a lot but I will say that the combination of the pandemic and the combination of the uprisings have sort of offered the kind of indisputable fact of a desire for, you know, I guess this term BIPOC gets thrown out a lot. Um, it's used in a lot of wellness spaces that I'm in, so I don't have any real angst against it. But, you know, the, the sort of understandable, uh, the understanding that BIPOC only and Black only spaces are needed. Um, in the world, in the virtual world, you know, that to me feels really delicious. And I've really been, I mean, I'm finishing out a breathwork program. I think it's been like 13 weeks. That's just all black, non-binary and femme folk. And 
it has been transformative and it has been incredible. And that is, you know, I, I think it would have come about either way, but I can, I can't speak to that. I can just speak to my experience of it right now. And it's amazing. You know, it's really amazing to think about the training we're doing and the conversations we're having in order to kind of continue. And all of us want to have practices that center black bodies or black queer bodies, including myself. And so just thinking about even this first class of like 15 um, practitioners who are going to go out in the world, that feels utopic to me. You know, I'm also like not, I have to investigate and interrogate the word utopia a little bit more because I don't exactly know if that's my goal either. I don't exactly know that that is even idyllic sounding to me. It sounds, no drama, it sounds terrifying. Um, no, but I just, I don't know what that means exactly. So I don't know if I'm, but but I think I'm just trying to point out that I I have felt really grateful um, that, that that is not a thing that, you know, and the, and the person who's running it was able to raise a lot of money and, you know, raise money to fund this whole program. I mean, that to me feels really exhilarating. So that that's like one little glimmer that I'm holding on to right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think I see a lot of little utopias everywhere. And so I was just, the kids were telling me about their cousins chat group, right? So that, so during the pandemic, they, we don't get together on Sundays. Um, so the cousins, um, their extended family of cousins and play cousins and, you know, each other gets together for other Zoom things or whatever, whatever, whatever you people are doing. Um, but it was the most hilarious thing because they were telling me this story that made me really laugh is the young, the youngest one and the oldest one got in a little disagreement. So because the oldest one had the power to kick the little one out because he was sassing, they kicked him out. And I just thought, and then they let him back in. And I was thinking about that. I was like, I love that they have this little community that they knitted together. It's <laughs> not, you know, if utopia is the idea that these are people you love, you can get together, you disagree, <laughs> mm -hmm. people can come out, you can say, I'm sorry, bring me back. Um, but you can, you know, that is a little utopia. I think um, the pandemic has created some little places, little spaces like that. My family, whenever it's somebody's birthday now, we get together and we have like our family gatherings were always a little bit crazy, but now they always involve dancing. So a hundred percent because we feel even happier to be together. Even if the dance, some people are on one side of the room, all the windows are open, fans are going. And I think that, um, you know, a utopia can be brief, <laughs> it can be small, um, mm -hmm. but it's about the joy and the trust and, you mm -hmm. know, the idea that, oh, we can get together, we can figure this out because we are um, team us. Yeah. No, you really shouldn't underestimate the power of black joy. And I think, it's also interesting that you said that utopias can be brief and small, as brief as a breathwork exercise or as brief as small joys in a group chat. And actually, I'm gonna do something, y'all are gonna hate me for this, but Nick, Callie, would you say that that group chat is a small <laughs> utopia for you? Spill the tea, Nick and Callie, where y'all at? I'm gonna open up the gallery view. <laughs> it's funny, that group chat is called Little Nuggets. Um, and it's funny because thinking about it, I wouldn't think of it as the utopia because, you know, we're in it. It's like, it's all kiki, but it really is in that sense of like, we're just, you know, finding joy with each other. And even, um, I feel like the pressure, like the lack of pressure from everyone feels so nice because we had a Zoom chat and me and Callie were together and it's, my, our, you know, our oldest cousin, Tashawn, and then um, our two younger cousins who are siblings. And they were just in and out, back and forth. And we we're like, you know what, let them do their thing. The older kids are just gonna chat, you know? And it like has that free flow to it. I know, I, I've never thought about it as a utopia, but, and it's true, Jen, I'm really, really contemplating that wording and how I feel mm -hmm. about using that and like what that actually means for me. But mm -hmm. it is true, like the sense of not only black joy, but constant community and thinking a lot about what does it mean to grow together not even just physically but like emotionally spiritually and seeing that growth because we're so many different ages too and how we are held accountable and how we hold each other accountable and how yes while we had the oldest cousin kicking out the youngest cousin in that moment like there are times where we are checked by the younger folk and 
it's like just a conglomeration of us all figuring things out together yeah. and being able to say, hey, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's correct or I think about this this way. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think thinking about it that way, it's like, this is the kind of community that I want to be in in the world. This is the kind of world that I want to work towards building and facilitating. And this is what liberation looks like in so many senses. And of mm -hmm. course, hopefully it wouldn't be us so all around the world and so far from each other, but it does allow us a different kind of access. And especially in what you were talking about of how like the cultural view shifts and how we interact with each other and what's the messaging um, overall. And it's like, this this is the beginning of that utopia and that utopic space. Mm. Come through. <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> love the Villa Rosa family just showing up with the gems. I love it. Oh yeah, this is clearly a really strong lineage. I'm excited about this particular black future right here. <laughs> but, but no, I Callie, I really like that point. And to you and Jenna's point, that like a utopia needs to be sustainable. A utopia is a sustainable process, I guess. And I guess that's what's kind of scary about the wording is that it it kind of intimates like an ending, mm. you know? Like you get there and the work is done. You're in the utopia, it will always be perfect and always be beautiful. But as Jenna recently said in a recent podcast about Westworld. Um, <laughs> Not the Westworld podcast, that's a deep cut. I feel like that was a deep cut. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to, <laughs> but. <laughs> Like utopias are there to be wary of in some regard. Mm. So I guess in that, in that same vein, what does a black future look like for you? If you're not trying to, if a black future isn't a utopia, if it's just legitimately like imagining what the future might look like for us. <clears throat> you see, this is a big question, but I'm gonna try and make it smaller. Um, I think, I'm interested in what you both foresee as what your ideal Black future would be for yourselves and to contrast that with what you maybe believe the Black, fu black future in the near future or whatever that is in conjunction with that. Um, I think for me, uh, part of it would be I was, would be in a different line of work. So um, I would not be writing about race, health, and inequality because it wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be having, you know, just today I was uh, revising an essay that was about Dr. Susan Moore, the woman who um, died because she didn't get, she got unfair treatment, even though she's a physician at a hospital in Indiana. So she ended up passing away and you know the reason that they gave was that she didn't get fair treatment was because she was in her knowledge became intimidating to the her, the hospital staff mm -hmm. and so that kind of thing and you know mm -hmm. like my whole work is about collecting stories like that putting it together looking at different issues ar specifically around health um, of inequality and unfairness and there are still so so much of that going on so i would say a uh, uh, you know, I would love a future where, you know, I could just sit around fishing all day and playing soccer and, you mm. know, being out in the sun and hanging out with my family and dancing. Um, but, you know, right now, since this is still happening in such a widespread way, and we're seeing so much of it right now around what's going on with COVID, that, um, you know, it's right in my face right now. So I'm thinking, I wish that wasn't true. But I mean, I love my work, but it's hard to, you know, understand this and keep seeing it mm. yeah, yeah most definitely i can't wait to read that story linda <sighs> Oof. it's a tough one but it's gonna be so good yeah mm -hmm. um yeah i think to linda's point i think not to get all kwanzaa about it but you know i think self-determination i think just the just the ability to decide for yourself you know like that's that really is a luxury, you know, and, and choices are so fraught in, in our um, in our lives right now, you know, and we're blamed for our choices. We oftentimes don't have choices. I mean, I think just the ability for people to figure out the answer to that question for themselves, what what is your ideal life? You know, that is 
a utopic black futures to me what, what do you want to do and have it be a real question that gets to be asked I mean that that really is where my mind goes mm -hmm. all right I think we're reaching the 45 minute mark um which means for those of you who are here um, I would love if y'all would drop questions in the comments that I can then relay to our lovely speakers here. But um, there also is a question I want to ask you both that I think, or really a question I would like you to ask each other. I wanted to ask, um, I did this in our last talk with Kimberly Foster and um, Juliana Huxtable, where, oh, goodbye, Nianas. <laughs> um, where I had them ask each other questions that they had wanted to ask each other or had, al had always wanted to ask one another. And I know you both are pretty close friends um, and know each other outside of this space. So I wanted to see, do you both have questions that you've never asked one another that you'd be willing to ask each, each other and answer <laughs> for us in this space? I'm not gonna ask a question. I'm gonna say a thing. Sure. Um, well, first, I, well, I'm sure, I'm sorry, kids, if this is embarrassing, but when you first asked me to be in the Black Futures, um, you know, in the anthology, I wasn't sure because I didn't know what I would have to say. Mm. But then I started thinking about how amazing your party would be, your book party. And I'm like, oh my God, Cameron yes. and Jenna are going to have the best book party ever. Oh my God. If I do not. Uh, contributing an essay, then I'm not going to necessarily be invited to the book party. Oh my God. So, <laughs> so would have been on our VIP list, trust me, either way. But I'm okay. so happy that that's what sold you. Oh yes. my God. I know it's petty, but um, I think we love it. one of the things I say is, want to say to you is I wish we could see each other more. Um, we um, got together, I guess, was that, um, I guess two sum was two summers ago at this point. Mm. And we just sat in um, my backyard eating um, food from my food co-op and drinking wine and hanging out. And that was still remains one of the best mm -hmm. times I've ever had because, you know, I think I used to think of you more of as a work colleague, but um, that was really nice. And um, I just really enjoyed that and want to do more of that. Yes, Linda, I'm infiltrating your social circle. I already know about the fishing trips. Leah told me everything. I'm coming on the next one. I'm listen, I'm embedded with the Woodson family. And like, it, I'm like, I'm making my way in. So just so you know, but I will text you all the time. I always want to text you, but then I'm like, Linda's so busy. I don't want to bother her, but you're always on my mind. And I always am like wondering what you're up to. So <laughs> maybe so, I should start calling you. It's okay. Fine, I'm here. Um, but I think, I think our, instead of asking each other questions, I think we needed to just show each other a little love because we haven't yeah. seen each other in a long time. Yeah. And so that, so thank you for accepting that. <laughs> yeah, that was really lovely. And I feel the same way about you. I really, I always think about that so fondly. And I think it's, um, you know, I've, I really do love getting a sense of how people live and how they make their lives. And I really admire you as a thinker and a cultural critic and a journalist. I've been reading your work for so long. And so it was just so incredible to feel um, within reach. Yeah. And to, and to become friends. Like that was such an incredible afternoon for me as well. We had so much fun. I got so tipsy and then I had to like get home and oh my goodness, but it was really fun. It was really yeah. wonderful. More of that. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little starstruck. I think it's kind of crazy that all of my heroes like hang out with each other. <laughs> like when you said the Woodson family, I was like, I just read Reddit the Bone. Mm -hmm. What is that? Oh, good. <laughs> but that's you, that is, your love for one another is palpable. And it's really, <laughs> I really, really love seeing this. Um, Jenna, did you say what you wanted to say to Linda in return? My question was just gonna be, when can we go fishing? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I'm not that's playing all, around. I know that's all. Well, that's how some people thought that I would be, write about that for the uh, your book, because um, I'm a little bit of a survivalist because I'm the one that it's like, well, <laughs> if anything happens, we want Linda in our survival pod because she can always get food for us. <laughs> and so <laughs> My next thing that I'm going to learn, my next um, goal is foraging. But um, trout fishing starts April 1st. OK, um, so, you know. We'll be in touch. 
we'll do that. And then I'll find us a mushroom foraging walk to go on together in like Prospect Park. Okay, good. I'll work that out. Cause I would okay. love to learn that too. So, yes. all right. This is beautiful. Can I come? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or like Nick, Callie, and I will just do it by ourselves. Yeah, I need a bigger boat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm seeing. Oh, all right. So we have one. Laith Ayogu is an incredible Black intellectual here at Bard. Mm -hmm. um, I look up to them a lot. And they um, posted a comment that I would like to read out to you. Mm, okay. I believe that it is important to trouble the expanse and application of utopia as a site of Black futurity. But in some ways, I'm not thinking about how the term is applicable. Granted, utopia is in many ways no place, and virtual interfacing has formed, has us forming collectives sitting in no one place, or an emergent place that is a whole new infrastructure ecology of being together, that may be indicative of how we move forward in making new kin networks and being together. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you have anything that delights you in being in no place and what you're dealing with is most complicated so that we can direct that energy there in future building. I feel like you put a question mark at the end of that comment, but no, I feel that. I think, do you both understand or maybe? I love this comment. I'm thinking about it so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Leith. Hi, Leith. You can be in my kin network anytime and you have been uh -huh. <laughs> so <laughs> come mushroom foraging with us mm -hmm. Laith, if you also want to speak if you had any like additions to your comment please do unmute i find it really difficult to get my thoughts into words a lot of the time so that's why it came out with the question mark mm -hmm. maybe right doesn't seem like a question but my question is what delights you both about being in no place because there are certain things that are like precious and new and different about these ways of interfacing and then also what you found most complicated and troubling because uh -huh. I'm sure you are not the only people experiencing those things as such and so how can we work collectively to try and remedy some of those areas? Um, I think during this period especially, um, I found a lot of happiness and joy being outside because as a writer and pro college teacher professor, I spend so much time indoors, but you know, I, I'm a very outdoorsy person, you know, I you know now I like fishing, but um, now being outdoors is even more important and being with nature and being in, in a little bit living in New York City, you forget that. <laughs> and you know you're just like rushing from place to place but I'm finding of so much more nourishment with being outdoors um, I think the hardest part recently for me is I'm a little bit introverted um, I mean I can speak in public um, but I'm a natural introvert but to see people like my mother who are like she's like a triple quadruple extrovert how hard it is not to be around people and not to get the, you know, some people get energy from being other around other people, other people get energy from being recharging, you know, alone. My mom needs more recharging energy with other people. Mm. And I see people struggling, not, not just her, but other people. And I find that hard. And so that's why I'm, you know, trying my best, even my introverted self to have kind of little pockets yeah. of um, community and, you know, talking and arguing, <laughs> kicking each other out, of the, bringing each other back, um, eating together on, you know, even if it's on the computer and certainly doing our best to, when we can, to be in community with each other. Because I mm -hmm. think I, I didn't, this is not something I ever really thought about as much until now. Mm, good answer. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Laith, for this really interesting prompt. I think something I've really liked about being no place is, you know, when we locked down, you know, the, the global, the shelter in place order came last spring. <clears throat> well, I went into hyperdrive with work and then I, I had a horrible burnout that I, 
frankly, I'm still recovering from, but I think it's really led me to really, really, really interrogate my relationship to work and how it is this like addictive thing that is very acceptable in our culture, acceptable in many cultures to be a workaholic, um, even though, you know, it can be as detrimental, I mean, it is as detrimental as, as many of the other um, addictions and, and compulsive habits are. And I think, you know, it's deeper than that for me. It's like, what does it mean to tether your sense of value and worth to what you produce? And I, I think people started having that conversation online. I think it just, it happened for me in a real visceral way. And I allowed myself also to just like gorge as much as I wanted to on lectures and talks and dance classes. And I was, I've been taking a million programs and doing all these things. And now I'm just kind of tapped out. And I think I'm in, I'm fully kind of in the no place of, of the nothingness sometimes of my life. Like I really do just sometimes take a bath and there's nothing else on. And that's really unheard of. And I think I, I kind of just like ate too much candy and got the belly ache. And so now I'm like really sitting in this new space of solitude and, you know, no social interactions. I mean, I, I'm being careful not to self-isolate because I do live alone and, um, my partner, uh, she lives in a different city than I do. So, you know, I'm really mindful of, of making sure that I'm not just alone all the time, but I'm finding this like, you know, really interesting space just with myself. And I think one of the things I'm learning right now too, is I, I'm, in, I'm really invested in wellness and not like the wellness industrial complex, which I, I feel really obviously critical of. And I interrogate a lot for myself, but just thinking so much about how wellness has become synonymous with self-optimization and what does it mean to kind of invert that, you know, because most people in this country are sick, anxious, depressed, or have a chronic health condition, you know, whether it's diabetes or high blood pressure. I just finished doing all this reporting for a story. So I'm not just pulling this out of thin air. This was like just my mind an hour ago. Um, but really thinking about inverting, like, you know, what does it mean to understand that, like, we are sick, like illness is, is more likely the default condition of everybody that lives in this country. And even if you're not physically ill, emotionally we're unwell, you know, because we're dealing with racism, racial injustice, gender discrimination, et cetera, transphobia, so many things. Um, and so I don't know, I feel like that's kind of where I'm, I, I feel like I've, I'm like an upside down from that show, Stranger Things, like everything, there's like a black light on everything and I'm seeing all this schmutz and I'm just like, really taking note of it. You know, I'm really, really, really reorienting myself in response to all of that. And that feels like a no, a no place too, as well, because it's not work that is happening anywhere else, but up here, so. Thank you so much, both of you for sharing. And it's such a pleasure to hear from you. And to see you, Lynn and Callie and Nick all in one three. That's all That's really nice. Thank you so much for that comment, Leigh. You literally never disappoint. But, um, all right, we have another um, comment from another great friend of mine, Isis, um, who says, more on utopia and black joy. Rebecca A. Wilcox, Ra, recently wrote a piece on black joy and black suffering in which Ra talks about black people finding joy in things that are ultimately, that ultimately are founded on a result in black death suffering, example, Kamala Harris. So I'm wondering what y'all's thoughts are on the different types of black joy. What is black joy? What makes it black? Must black joy always be a response to anti-black violence? Can black joy exist separate from black suffering? Mm. Good question, Isis, thank you. And I'm gonna look up this piece by Rebecca A. Wilson, Wilcox, excuse me, thank you. I'm gonna look that up. They're a really cool queer black intellectual that we met on Clubhouse. So I like- Oh, I love, <laughs> cute, okay. So yeah, definitely their work is really cool alongside Hunter Shackelford's, but you answer. Oh. I'm gonna have to follow up with you after this and be like, please send me this stuff. Hmm. Um, well, one thing I wanna say right away is black joy, we all experience it outside of suffering, you know, and I don't think the condition of blackness is, is inherently suffering. So I don't think that, um, or maybe it is, but I, I, I'm inclined to think that there is so much joy to be found in ways that have absolutely nothing to do with anything else. And I think 
it's interesting because I think it often takes place or it happens at the site where suffering also happens. So that's tricky. But I was thinking about like, um, like how it's been versus how it's going, those memes. Like, I don't know, there's just been so many, and and that's like a really simple version, but, or even just like how I feel when I walk into an all black space. I mean, that has nothing to do with suffering or if I'm going to a friend's house for dinner or a meal, or, you know, there are just these moments that have nothing to do with, with that. And I think it's really important to remember that too, that oftentimes we do utilize it as a tool, as a way to you know, re-inoculate ourselves and, and re-ground ourselves and remind ourselves, you know, and, and reconnect and re all the re's ought to remember. But I, I don't know, I'm thinking a lot about the way it happens independent of anything else. There's just like such a sheer pleasure of existence that I don't know if that happens for other groups or other cultures. Like I really wanna know. And I, I'm in some ways I'm kind of scared to know because I think if, if that happens fully with white people, that's terrifying, um, but it must happen. But I, you know, so it's interesting to think about like what the function, you know, again, cause I've been doing all this research into the, into the value, you know, work and how work is tied to capitalism and how we think about our value and, you know, love this, a lot of the works I've been reading talk about how love is not a capitalist product because it, there's just, there's nothing to be gained from it. Like it's such, it takes so much energy, you know, it's, it's really, and I think joy is kind of the same way, you know, like it's kind of the same thing. Like it, it is just, it can be its own um, empirical thing. I don't know if that answers the question, but I'd be curious to know if Linda has any thoughts before I just keep rambling. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about it. I think part of it is, when people were thinking about black joy, it was sort of like, whoa, we're so surprised that there can be this thing because there's so much of black suffering and black sadness and black death. And then how are these people, mm -hmm. um, this group of people who has been so harmed now so joyful? And it's sort of like, I was thinking about that contrast and how that got played up. And it's like, oh, because of how, what it looks like, because, you know, because I don't think of black joy in this separate, you know, sort of dichotomy with black pain and suffering. It's just, you know, it's, it's like how my mom dances after at the end of every party, you know, she just is like, okay, where's my Henny and give me my, put my music on my old music and let me dance. And I don't care who sees, I don't care. And none of the rest of us do. And it's just this, you know, freedom, free spirited outpouring, you know, that has nothing to do with suffering. And so I think we shouldn't, think of it that way. Um, I think that that's a, a frame that is limiting. Hmm. As in, that answer. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> you're totally fine. Um, I, I wanted to follow up with Linda. Do you mean as in like black framing like black joy is like a limiting? No, framing Maybe. black joy in as a contrast to black suffering is limiting. Mm -hmm. When black joy is just a thing in itself, and it could be individual, collective. Um, I don't think it has to be uh, sort of seen as the flip side of something bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I think I was thinking a lot about that um, earlier in this conversation when we were trying to answer questions about what we want our future to look like. And I was thinking about how, as you and Jenna were talking about, like you're trying to work yourself out of a job. Like, <laughs> like ideally the future doesn't have a place where you're needed in it. Mm. But I think a lot about how grateful I am for this. Like I'm, I'm very interested in critical, in critical race theory. I am so interested in like black cultural production and I don't, I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with this question, but like, I think a lot about how I, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't have this if it wasn't for black suffering. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily have black joy or I wouldn't necessarily have um, a lot of forms of like, or, or like black protest or black revolution or black like, like works like Bell Hooks's or all of Aja Lord's um, 
I want to say discography, but that is not the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Great sense, but you know, I wonder, I wonder, you know, because we will ultimately never know in yeah. our lifetimes at least, right? And I think a lot about there are so many expressions of um because this was like a question I feel like we got right in the 2016 election, which was like, well, think of all the art that's going to come out of this moment and Trump being elected. And I remember just feeling like, you know, art is born for so many reasons, you know, like artists are moved by so many things and, and suffering is, is in that pyramid, but it's not the only thing in that pyramid. And Most so, definitely. you know, it's, it's exciting to think about what would it look like if we could create and we could make not from that place of suffering and not from this place of pain. And, you know, I think if I if I were to get far enough into the future where my work isn't needed, then I think my I would be a farmer, which would always be needed. I'd be a sustainable herbalist, you know, like I would have, I would have a job. It would just be one that um, serves a totally different function than the one I had before. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I, I think that's like, yeah. That can be kind of list. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Mm. Mm. I'd be fishing on the farm and maybe writing fiction instead. Yes. <laughs> maybe I could start, you know, writing poetry or something different. Um, but I think we wouldn't be the same without our suffering and we wouldn't be mm. the same without our, you know, how we've uh, survived suffering and reacted to it, fought against it. And mm. our country wouldn't be the same without this um you know the what we've gone through and it's you know terrible some of it but some of it's beautiful and that's you know I was thinking about I was giving a talk about the 1619 project and I could see people going a little down and I said wait that project is not just about it's about the legacy of African Americans not just about you know the everything terrible that happened in the past and the lingering effects of enslavement it's about what that has meant for for the country and um, the way that the black movement inspired other movements or the, you know, the, the sort of the legacy in um, one of the pieces in that was about the students from Howard who lost, who decided to be lawyers. And then they looked up their last enslaved relative to see, you know, what happened when they were freed. And it was very interesting. And it did put a, you know, a nice spin on that piece and I so sometimes when I'm talking because some of the stuff I write about is really sad and hard as I say remember that this was you know this has been important and transformative not just what we've been through how it shaped us as a you know culture and a race but also how it shaped the whole you know all of us mm. I think about that as well and also your examples of like black invisibility of like those utopias may only be able to flourish in in places of invisibility underneath the larger um i guess the larger oppressive structure but i i also don't want that to be the truth mm -hmm. I, I see both sides or i feel both sides mm -hmm. um hmm. well i see all right I also wanted to ask my own little, another little question of mine um, was, so on this topic, I think maybe this is more obvious towards you, Jenna, um, being the person that um, helped collect the anthology. When curating this, were you thinking about trying to, because your, your Black Futures is basically like a BIPOC space. It's a Black space that you've created within a book. And so, for you when curating the anthology were you thinking about sort the source of where the work was coming from like did you specifically choose work that tries not to center black suffering or does or doesn't mm. or what was the mindset for you mm. are you really really um when kimberly and i were doing when we were pulling the book together because we we're, we're co-editors on it um it it didn't it wasn't really um, a conscious, I mean, their their book opens with, you know, screenshots from BLM protests. So it's certainly, you know, the as much as possible, try and reflect a spectrum of human experiences um, that these black people have. And 
I think we were just trying to gather things that felt urgent, things that we wanted to remember, things that we didn't want people to forget and prompts. I mean, it was a really multifaceted curatorial process. Um, and we did organize things around themes. It felt really important to talk about legacy. It felt really important to talk about, you know, <clears throat> the legacy of Black is Beautiful. And so we have a chapter called Black is Still Beautiful. Um, we talked about power. We talked about how far ownership is. I think it was, and that was kind of our publisher was like, cause we had just been kind of organizing everything in the book. And he was like, maybe you guys should have chapters and themes. And, and that was really helpful. But I think it was really trying to just acknowledge it. Like Linda was saying, it's all bound up together. And that, that is, that is, you know, the state of, of our existence. It's not possible to separate. And if we made a book that had none of that, it would be delusional. Like it, people would be like, what sense does this make, you know? Um, so it really did come, it was a very collaborative and I mean, it took five years of just trying to figure out what needed to be in this book. And we're, I mean, I, there's still so much I didn't make it in, which is so wild. And it still has very much, you know, it's in English, you know, there's a lot that's limiting in terms of, it doesn't even come close to capturing the breadth of experiences. Um, yeah. yeah. And in some ways, I don't think you should necessarily be responsible for being able to cover the breadth of all of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what I like is I think that because um, Jenna, it's you and Kimberly, mm -hmm. you both are so creative and such expansive thinkers um, that you brought a kind of magic to it. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'll just be really specific is the essay that I did, um, you paired me with Jordan Castile. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's my, here's her. Art. Here's the artwork that goes with it, babies. And um, Jordan is also from Denver, like me. Our mothers know each other. And when you look at a picture <laughs> of young Jordan, it looks like, I mean, regular Jordan, it looks like young me. You didn't even know that. But That's you amazing. paired us together. And I just thought, oh, there's magic here. You have, you know, like you really brought something bigger to this project mm -hmm. both of you. and you know that's what I'm super proud of for that and mm -hmm. and appreciate I love that there's so much family in this book mm -hmm. in so many ways I'm coming to find um but no that's incredibly interesting and I, I'm also that also makes me wonder like what the knockoffs look like like what the other images that were in I guess competition for Jenna's for um, Linda's piece looked like. That was the first one. It, it was really just like we have this incredible essay, and, and like it really was like who would be. And I think that show had just been up at the Studio Museum, and Kimberly was like, "Did you see this show? Do you like this image?" And we were like, "Perfect." That was a lot of how the process was like feeling and in, feeling into something, and then what would go with this, and then yeah, yeah. This process sounds like Black Joy. It was yeah. fun. it was hard. It was fun. <laughs> Yeah, such but, as the process of the book. But I think with with my work, which I don't necessarily think is super creative, but sometimes it is, um, you know when you're doing, when you're going the right direction, because there's this kind of magic that happens and there, there's kind of breadcrumbs that lead you to the right place, or there's this kind of thing that's like, it's a feeling and you follow mm -hmm. it and it becomes what it's supposed to be. And I mean, my I follow that in my journalistic work. Um, and I felt like a little bit of that spirit in, you know, I felt more than a little, I felt that spirit in your book and which I think is clear. It, you know, it worked for you, mm. you did a good job. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I see that a lot of people are starting to trickle out um, as we're getting closer to the end date and or the end time. So I wanna say thank you Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for speaking with me today and letting me interact with my friends and, <laughs> and talking and just being incredibly cool individuals. Um, I wanna say, I think, unless there's any last minute questions, also I wanna bring attention to, um, I put in the chat at the beginning and during the talk, but there is a GoFundMe for um, a black queer housing fund that, um, I'm really trying to get a, get a lot of funds for. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, please do. But um, yeah, I think that might be the end of our talk for today. Mm. Um, well, thank you. I, 
you did a lot of work to put this together and we yeah. really appreciate you and um, your energy and your spirit and your kindness. So thank you. Mm. Uh, no, I'm just mirroring both of you. <laughs> thank you so much. I sincerely appreciate